Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so thanks again for allowing me to come and talk about the partogram, the old and the new. It is a very tricky discussion. Um, like Billy actually so wonderfully said in his introduction, the partogram and intrapartum care is something that has been sort of stag stagnant for decades without much change um, to the actual management of labor. And we've been accepting what we have been doing for so long, for a very long time. So I know when the new partogram came out and the new um, intrapartum care guidelines, there was a little bit of confusion as to what was issued, what is now accepted standard practice, and people generally see change and we are not familiar with change and then we are actually reluctant to implement it. So I hope that, you know, I can talk about the partogram for hours, I think probably even for days, but I'm hoping that within the time span of maybe 40, 50 minutes, I can actually talk about the partogram, why it has changed and to ease some of the fears or reluctancies um, that, that some people may have while using the partogram and to actually explain what has been going on. So I've also been lucky to, been, to have been a part of, of the, the guideline group in South Africa that was in charge of updating um, the intrapartum care guideline that, that we have, as we know it, that is still in the maternity care guidelines, which we are currently also busy um, updating. So um, I know, I understand, let me put it that way, quite well why it has changed and I, and I find myself fully behind it. So um, firstly, as introduction, what is an intrapartum care guideline? The, the main thing to understand is that a guideline is not law. A guideline consists of recommendations. It's not rules, it's recommendations on how to best manage a low risk woman in labor. So that is quite important to keep in mind. When we talk about the partogram, we are talking about nearly 90% of our population, the women who are low risk that present to your facility in labor or for induction without any uh, medical or other obstetric risk factor. We are not talking about VBACs, we are not talking about women with help syndrome, we are talking about the, the, the normal, healthy, low risk woman. Now, what is the partogram? When we all think partogram, we think cervix. That's sort of the, auto, the um, automatic association we all make. We think partogram, we think action lines, we think cervix, but it's actually, a lot more. It allows for recordings of uh, the observations of both the mother and the fetus. It's more than a cervix alone, you know. Labor should actually be about the mom and the baby rather than um, about a cervix alone. And I hope that is a message that I will really get across today. And then on top of the observations, it allows for a graphical recording of the cervical dilatation and therefore also the progress of labor. So why has it been updated? And every time I give this talk, I say recently, it's actually not that recent anymore. These came out in 2018. You know, with these COVID years, we've all, I think, forgotten a little bit how many years have already gone by, but this is actually four years ago. So the WHO issued um, new intrapartum care recommendations, and that is what the South African guidelines are actually um, based on. It is not something that we invented ourselves. It actually comes from a, a well-esteemed international um, organization. So firstly, as a bit of background, and I think we all know this, our cesarean section rate is increasing. It has been steadily increasing over the past few years, and it keeps increasing, not just in South Africa, but even um, worldwide. So what does that lead to? We know that obstetric hemorrhage is still one of the leading causes of maternal death. It's in the top three, and it's um, actually, if you look at direct causes of maternal death, the second cause. Obstetric hemorrhage, when we think hemorrhage, we always thinking abrupt shows and things like that. Yes, indeed, they each carry a high risk of, of, of bleeding, but the majority of deaths due to obstetric hemorrhage is actually related to bleeding during or after seizure. It accounts for nearly a third of all the hemorrhage deaths. And we know that when we look at hemorrhage deaths, that the majority is actually potentially preventable. And that is sad. So how do we actually reduce these deaths and morbidities due to obstetric hemorrhage associated with seizure, well, we must try to reduce the primary seizure rate. We must try and avoid that primary seizure in the first place. Now, the ACOG actually has a nice paper on how one can try and reduce your primary seizure rate, um, including offering ECVs for breach deliveries, training on CTG interpretation, but the partogram intrapartum care is actually a big part of that because we are doing a lot of seizures for poor progress of labor. 
So what we are trying to avoid is basically the partogram you see here. And that is a very old partogram. And this is a partogram, a, a picture that um, we have sort of loaned or adopted from Prof. Gebat in, in, in Stellenbosch, who has also been a big part of this intrapartum care group, is that we are dealing with women who are three, four centimeters, the cervix is not effaced, and now we are doing seizures for poor progress of labor because she has supposedly crossed the action line. That is the one end of the spectrum. Now, on the other end, we have our obstructed labor. We keep looking um, at a partogram, we allow this woman to progress, and then we're dealing with compound presentations, we're dealing with slow progress, leading to ruptured uteruses, and um, we are delivering FSBs or fresh stillborn babies. So now, just to take you back a little bit to why the WHO has changed um, their recommendations. So firstly, the partogram, as we know, it, and don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with too, too much research, I just want to show a few things. So as Billy said in, in the introduction, is that intrapartum care and the partogram and the active management um, as we know it is actually based on um, Professor Emmanuel Friedman's research from the 80s. It's been a while and he was, um, or he is still a very um, well-esteemed, well-respected professor. He is also a pioneer who actually did research into, into intrapartum care, into the natural progress of labor. <clears throat> and that one centimeter per hour, so the alert line that we follow is actually based on that. Now we must acknowledge that those first papers that were published were actually small groups of women, two, 300 women. It was in the US, in the United States, where the majority of women in the research was Caucasian, were white women, right? Then actually his, his findings, his pioneer research work has led us all worldwide to adopt that one centimeter per hour progress, right? Now, we've, the WHO has been doing more research into now this natural progress of labor because this one centimeter per hour, we all know we do a lot of augmentation. We do a lot of AROM, we give, we give a lot of oxytocin and we end up with a lot of cesarean sections for either poor progress or fetal distress because we are augmenting or a combination of the both. So, I don't know, maybe you have heard of, of the other researcher before, a guy called Zhang, who from the early 2000s also started getting this new invested interest in, in, in studying the progress of labor. And he came to a conclusion that this one centimeter per hour is actually not really applicable to the majority of women in labor. Na he also established that labor usually only accelerates after four, five, six centimeters has been reached. And then we can go faster than that one centimeter per hour. But up until that, it's actually slow. On top of that, labor seems to be very variable. It is um, not a set rule. It is not the same for every laboring woman. And I'm sure that all the, the people listening to this webinar also realize that labor is not the same for every woman. And I think we all know that. Now, the WHO then subsequently started doing um, research. So they've done a big project, which is called the BOLD, Better Outcomes in Labor Difficulties, where they also assessed laboring women, progress of labor, outcomes for mom, outcomes for the baby, and so on. And this is the graph that you actually see here. So these studies were done in Nigeria and Uganda, so much closer to home for us. And yes, I am from Belgium, but South Africa is very much home to me right now. So I'm, I'm calling this closer to home, right? We had, or they had, sorry, nearly 10,000 women in this study. And what they did is they looked at the progress of labor, basically looking at the cervical dilatation. Because many of us believe or believed that a lot of HIEs, perinatal deaths, asphyxiated babies are due to poor progress of labor and us watching them on a partogram and not intervening and then we have an asphyxiated child. So they wanted to see, is it now truly the cervical dilatation and the progress of labor that is predicting this adverse outcomes. And I'm assuming that with this talk, you all know the answer already, but let me take you through this graph anyway. So what you see here is actually a WHO partograph as it was before this update, meaning the active phase starting at four centimeters, you see the dilatation up to 10 on the Y axis and in the, on the horizontal X axis, you see the time in hours. So you see the alert line, as we know it, starting at four and time zero going at one centimeter per hour. And then four hours to the right, you see the action line. Um, if you 
know our, I'm, I'm still calling it the old pathograph now, the one that we um, sort of standard used up until two years ago when the new one was issued. Our action line, or I'm actually sitting here um, holding the, 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 the fingers up, our action line is actually a review line and is not four hours to the right, it's two hours to the right, because we always keep in mind that in South Africa, we work in a setting, especially in public health, where we still have to transfer women and so on. So we don't really have an action line, we have a review line, two hours to the right of the alert line. Now back to this graph. Dr. So what Valerie, you, yes. if, if I may check, which slide are you on? Are you still on the background The graph slide? one. Yes, oh, I'm okay, still on the part of the comment one. in the chat. Okay, no, it's fine. No Thanks. worries. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I Maybe sometimes if you can use the mouse to point, if you can use yes, the can mouse. You see it? To, yes, we can see it nicely. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Sorry, man. So back to this graph. So I was deviating a little bit, explaining that our line, so our review line actually runs here at the two hours. So if you have an older partogram, just have a look at where our lines um, actually run. Now, these are results from this bold study in Nigeria and Uganda. So what you see here is all the laboring women. The gray lines are women who had normal outcomes. So no HIE, no asphyxiated baby, no perinatal death. The red lines are the women who had an adverse neonatal outcome. So the ones we are worried about, the ones we think may be due to poor progress. Now, what you see here is that the majority of women that had a red partogram, the ones with an adverse outcome, actually never crossed the action line. So this in, in a very basic explanation is, is um, led to the conclusion that the cervical dilatation, that progress of labor on its own is a poor predictor of adverse outcome. And that is one of the main findings that led to believe that, listen, we should stop focusing on the cervix alone. Now then on top of that, they also looked, and I'm not gonna go into detail. So what you see here is again, dilatation on the Y axis, time on the X axis. These are labor curves um, in that same bold group done in Nigeria and Uganda. So you could draw an imaginary alert line on the left here, and then you see that four hour action line. And what they did is they divided all their laboring women according to the Robson criteria, and they plotted the 95th centile for each group. Meaning the 95th centile, the longest duration it took to still have a normal outcome to progress from the one centimeter to the next, from four to five, from five to six, and so on. So they actually sort of had the same findings as Zhang, the previous researcher in the early 2000s, who started seeing that, listen, that one centimeter per hour from four centimeters, that's a bit um, overrated, and labor is actually very variable, and we should be a little bit more patient. I'm not going to elaborate more on the research behind it. I just want to get to what has now changed based on what we found. So firstly, and I'm not going to go through all 54 recommendations, just a few highlights. The double, these are from the WHO recommendations that the latent phase of labor um, is characterized by contractions and variable changes of the cervix. There's a slower progression of labor and that should actually include the four centimeters, meaning the active phase should only start at five centimeters and is then characterized by a substantial degree of cervical effacement and more rapid cervical dilatation. There's no standard duration of the latent phase. And I think from practice, we all know that. To, to go from a completely closed, long, firm cervix to a nicely, well effaced five centimeter cervix, it takes time. And for some women, it's much quicker than for others. So there's no standard duration for the latent phase. But what they recommend is that the active first stage, meaning from five to full cervical dilatation, usually does not extend beyond 12 hours in first labors and beyond 10 hours in subsequent labors. They also concluded that that one centimeter per hour rule in the active phase of labor um, is inaccurate to identify the women at, adverse, uh, at risk of adverse outcomes. And it's also unrealistically fast for a lot of women. So a slower cervical dilatation rate alone, keep in mind alone, should not be a routine indication for intervention. We should especially withhold our interventions before five centimeters, because as we said, the latent phase is the time where it really takes time to progress because we're not just relying on, on dilatation, we're also looking at effacement, which is a timely process. Then they also recommend, and I've put it, I've added that here at the bottom, 
that vaginal examinations in the active phase should be done four hourly rather than two hourly. The conclusion of, not of my talk, yeah, I'm not done yet, but the conclusion of the WHO recommendations is that in the end, every woman should have a positive childbirth experience and labor should be as physiological as possible. They did not come to this conclusion based on what they felt that women should be laboring a bit longer and they all have an NVD. This also comes from a lot of satisfaction questionnaires and surveys they've done with, with, with laboring women as well. So the WHO recommends to actually stay away from alert and action lines. And they are in the process and they have actually published um, uh, a paper on, on, on their new partogram, which is called the Labor Care Guide, where there are no longer any alert or action lines to be found. Now, when we did this guideline update, we thought that's now a very drastic change. And I don't think us here in South Africa are ready for that. On top of that, that labor care guide needs to be piloted. We've done a small sp uh, pilot study in South Africa where it shows that it is actually possible and it does not necessarily increase labor much, long, um, much more than, than, than the duration as we know it. But still, it's a drastic change. And we know if we want to do drastic change here, we're going to meet a lot of reluctance. So we updated the partogram to the one we currently know in the maternity case record, which is this one. And I've put the top part here just um, for everyone to see. So one of the main things you see is that the active phase starts at five centimeters. Does that one centimeter make a big difference? It, it still is a very arbitrary cutoff, but yes, we should be getting away from these early um, interventions at three at four and, and four centimeters. We all know the active phase, excuse me, um, we all know the active phase as four centimeters. Before that, it actually used to be three. And who knows, maybe 10 years from now, we have in this chat again, and then the active phase will start at six. But for now, it is accepted that the active phase should start at five centimeters. We still have our alert line, and then two hours to the right, we have our review line, because we felt like we couldn't be getting away with the, with the lines completely. On the right side, so the active phase is a one centimeter per block. So every uh, one hour per block, so every block counts for one hour. Now on the left hand, you see the latent phase that used to have eight blocks, now has 12 blocks. But instead of every block being one hour, every block is two hours. Many people feel that, so that means 24 hours for the latent phase. So many people may feel that this is actually too long. Keep in mind, the majority of women is long in the active phase before the 24 hours has been reached. We should not be too worried about that. The thing to remember is we are trying to get away from interventions in early labor when both mom and baby are actually doing fine. So we have two hourly blocks in the latent phase and we go up to 24 hours. So those are the major changes um, on, on, on the partogram when it comes to the actual progress of labor. Now, obviously, with that partogram actually comes a guideline on, on how to use the partogram, firstly, but secondly, also, how should we now monitor labor? If we allow for more time, are we going to do our PVs two hourly, four hourly, and so on? And again, it all seems complicated, but it actually really, really isn't. So the first thing um, of the guideline is actually respectful care. And I'm I'm not going to, to spend too much time on that, even though it should actually be one of the most important things that we focus on in labor. And secondly, it's a thing that is very, very often overlooked. So just the points that sort of fall under respectful, woman-centered quality care. Number one is companionship in labor. It's one of the only interventions proven to actually benefit the outcomes. No woman should be laboring by herself. Um, second to that is then we must create and respect the woman's privacy. And many people feel that companionship and privacy don't go hand in hand, that allowing the one woman a companion in labor invades the other woman's right to privacy. Now, what we need to remember is that a labor ward is not a shopping mall. It is not a supermarket. It is not a place where people should be walking in or out. A companion in labor should actually already be appointed during her antenatal care attend or accompany the woman upon admission and stay in the room with that woman. If you don't have separate rooms, curtains or things like that could be um, put up and therefore we are not actually invading um, the neighboring women's um, privacies. 
then we must keep in mind that we must always always respect a woman's dignity. We should not be discriminating, withholding care or um, abusing women physically. And we all think this is straightforward, but it happens almost every day in, in labor wards and it's sad. We must keep in mind that pregnant women are a vulnerable group on their own, but then we have the extremely vulnerable. We have foreign women, we have teenagers, we have um, women with, with language barriers, with, with um, 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 a reduced IQ. So we need to be very careful that we are not discriminating and we are not judging. Withholding of care, again, we all think we never withhold care, but withholding of care could be as simple as a woman who is shouting for help, um, shouting that her baby is coming and no one attends to that woman immediately. Physical abuse is the slapping on the legs, the slapping on the cheek to get a woman's attention. We always need to pay, pay attention to a woman's need of um, pain relief, which is obviously a lot more than the pethidine or things that, that, that we know. It includes mobilizing, it includes massaging, some heat on the back, um, things like that. It is not just a medical pain relief. We focus on respectful communication, no shouting. Women should be allowed to mobilize or adopt a comfortable position, whether that is leaning forward on the bed, um, squatting, sitting on hands and knees. There is no reason for a low-risk woman with normal fetal heart monitoring to be chained to a CTG for hours lying on her left hand uh, side. A woman should be allowed to in intake some fluids and food except the food we don't really recommend. And I think we all know that a woman in the second stage is sometimes likely to vomit. So we try to avoid food in the second stage and we need to pay attention to hygiene. Um, fetal monitoring, again, uh, not much has changed. Um, maybe some people feel like this is all just too much. This has actually all not changed. Changed. Fetal monitoring is, is something that is crucial to prevent intrapartum asphyxia. For a low-risk woman in labor, it is recommended to use intermittent auscultation because CTGs have not been proven to reduce the, the, the um, perinatal morbidity and mortality outcomes. All that the CTG in a low-risk woman has been shown to do is increase your seizure rate. Secondly, we all have a tendency, I think, well, I, I shouldn't say all, but I speak for, for myself and our labor ward, we, we, we tend to put women on a CTG thinking we are monitoring and then we leave her there. We are now busy and we don't look at it for 45 minutes. So we should be doing intermittent auscultation that also truly focuses uh, or forces us to focus on that heart rate and actually properly interpret our findings. It is recommended to use a Doppler device because first it's much easier to use than, than pinas or, or things like that. And secondly, the woman can also hear the heart rate or other people in the room. When should we do this? We should be doing it after a contraction, listening for one full minute. Why not during the contraction? Firstly, it's extremely difficult. Secondly, the woman might be moving because of the pain. And thirdly, what we will hear if we hear a deceleration during a contraction, we're hearing early or typical variable D cells, which are actually not pathological on their own. We want to hear if the baby is back to its normal heart rate um, after a contraction. So what then is fetal distress? It's a change in baseline. So meaning the baby does not recover to its heart rate as before, it's higher or lower, or there's still a deceleration after the contraction has passed. If we have fetal distress, we need to take action. And we all sometimes think action is seizure. It is definitely not. It could be a seizure, but it could just as much be um, summoning help, assessing the woman. Maybe she's now fully dilated. Um, we want to start a CTG now. We might want to do intrapartum resuscitation, or we might want to transfer a woman to a facility where cesarean section is available. Then who actually needs a CTG from the onset of labor is, are all the women at high risk of complications. And I'm not gonna go through this list, but we're thinking of abnormal vitals, meconium stain like or twins, um, IUGR and things like that. Labor diagnosis, again, we are not reinventing the wheel here. We are sticking to what we know. Labor is still labor. It's contractions with any of the following, meaning cervical changes, rupture of membranes, or a show. What is now progress in labor? It is more than the cervical dilatation alone. Yes, if the cervix dilates, we have progress in labor. But we, if we, on top of that, have descent of the presenting part, if we go from poor to a well-applied head, to an actual descent, our labor is, or that woman's labor, sorry, not our, is actually progressing. Um, excuse me, I'm just going to have a sip of water. Good. So 
The latent phase, like we said, zero to four or zero up to five, four including in the latent phase. The duration meaning up to 24 hours. Keep in mind the latent phase takes time. It is a, the phase characterized by a slower progress that cervix needs to efface and it needs to dilate. The head needs to descend. So we need to give that laboring woman time. And I'm going to come back to that. Everything we say is on the condition that both the mother and the fetus are doing well. Active phase from five centimeters to full dilatation. As mentioned before in WHO and something that's adopted, it can go up to 12 hours in a prime up and it can go up to 10 hours in a multiple. We are going, going to come back to what happens if, if labor is actually progressing slow, what should we do? Active phase also characterized by regular contractions. So again, here's the full partogram now as it has been updated. Where on the left, you see the latent phase and on the right, you see the um, active phase. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the latent phase, 12 blocks, two hours per block, allowing for 24 hour monitoring. The active phase, one hour per block, alert line and a review line. If you um, need to understand or remember something about this whole thing, it's one, why has the partogram changed? And two, would be this the frequency of the observations? It sounds, again, a bit confusing, maybe a little bit complicated, but it actually really isn't. So firstly, fetal monitoring. What is reassuring? It hasn't changed at all. We are still in the, in the, in the, uh, first stage of labor are monitoring the fetus the same way as we know it. Every two hours in the latent phase, every 30 minutes in the active phase. We are talking about intermittent auscultation, obviously. Um, some societies will recommend every four hours in the latent phase, but we need to keep in mind that South Africa deals with a lot of unexplained stillbirths. We have a lot of undiagnosed fetal growth restriction at term that we only diagnose once the baby is actually born. So we need to keep in mind that those babies, even though they, um, or those fetuses belong to a low risk healthy mother, we need to keep in mind that some of our fetuses may be more vulnerable than we initially anticipated. So two hourly monitoring in the latent phase, every 30 minutes in the active phase. Maternal heart rate at the same time. Not because we think the mother's heart rate is going to change, but because we want to differentiate between the two patients that we have. We want to make sure that we are monitoring the mother and not the fetus, because you all know the mother's heart rate may also go up during a contraction and, and sort of mimic a fetal heart rate. Then the mother's vitals, and it's written there in the latent phase um, every six hours, in the active phase every four hours. What is the easiest to remember is do it at the time you do a vaginal examination. See that assessment when we are doing, doing a vaginal examination. See that as the time when you actually have to assess the woman sort of from, from head to toe. Urine, again, low risk woman in labor. There's no need to, to put a catheter or anything like that. This is not a help syndrome. It's not a feedback. We test the urine when the urine is passed. We check for the volume. We check for, for ketones and so on. Nothing changed. Labor, contractions, nothing changes. We monitor the contractions every two hours. We see how long they last and how frequent they come. And then we obviously express that in the number of contractions per 10 minutes. When must you um, check your contractions more frequently? It's obviously when we are now talking about oxytocin or some, something like that. If we want to titrate our oxytocin up every 30 minutes, we should obviously be assessing contractions more frequently. Every 30 minutes before we titrate, we should see if we're not having, uh, already having achieved the number of contractions we were aiming for. Then the vaginal examination. And to understand where these intervals are coming from, I'm taking you back to what WHO says. Because we are giving the woman more time in the active phase, we should not be doing PVs every two hours. We're only going to make the woman uncomfortable. It is a timely examination because now this mobilizing woman needs to get on the bed, needs to undress. We need to do that examination and we may be introducing an infection. So we adopted that same every four hours in the active phase. I'm gonna come back to this eight centimeter thing, but every four hours in the active phase. What does that mean for the latent phase? We used to do every four hours there, but keep in mind, now we are giving this laboring woman more time in the latent phase. And yes, we are monitoring the fetal heart. We are monitoring the contractions. If we see that increasing, we can adjust our interval, but let's just, <clears throat> excuse me, 
do our PVs in the latent phase every six hours. There's no need if, if that woman's condition is not changing, we are monitoring that baby. There's no need to make that woman uncomfortable every four hours. We've extended that interval to every six hours. Now, what does it say that in the active phase from eight centimeters onwards, we can do every two hours. That is basically because again, we are dealing in a setting with a setting where some women may still need to be transferred towards the end of, of, of their labor. Good, so that's our frequency of observations. Now, obviously, and this is actually very, very straightforward. When should you consider doing your, your vaginal examination earlier? And again, this is not reinventing the wheel. Obviously, if the woman has an urge to bear down, whether she was one or five or eight centimeters, we are going to assess her. We are not going to say, Okay, ma'am, um, your PV is only due in three hours. So even though you want to push, I'm not going to check you. Obviously, we are going to check. Secondly, also quite, quite self-explanatory, if the fetal or maternal condition is non-reassuring, if we now see the mother's vitals are changing or the fetal heart rate is changing, we need to do a full assessment of both mother and fetus. And that includes a vaginal examination. So that is, is, is quite obvious. Now, what else is there um, added on in the latent phase? It is basically any indication you may have that this woman is transitioning from the latent to the active phase. Is, are the centimeters really important? Not necessarily. What's more important here that, is that if you now have a woman in the active phase, that we should increase the intervals of our fetal monitoring because active phase, more contractions, stronger contractions, longer contractions. So longer periods of time where the blood flow to the blood flow to the fetus is decreased. So more chances of fetal distress. So that is why it's so important to monitor contractions and to see how the woman copes with it. So if, and midwives I think are the best people here. They can see, they have that, 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 that skill to determine that this woman is now in the active phase because the way she handles the contractions, the way that woman is behaving, um, um, it looks like she's in the active phase. And trust me, I know we've all been fooled where we think a woman is nearly fully dilated and she's too, but generally, um, if that impression is there that the things have changed, this woman might be in the active phase. Secondly, so if the contractions increase, let's say we went from two per 10 minutes, lasting 30 seconds. Now we have four lasting 50 seconds. Those are sort of what we would want to call active phase contractions. Then obviously, if there's a need for opiate analgesia, we just need to have a look, see what's happening there. And then with rupture of membranes, I know we are all tempted to do a PV. Um, again, we are just introducing infection. So we'd rather not PV, we do fetal monitoring if ruptures, if membranes rupture. If we suspect any cord prolapse, the fetal heart rate will tell us, and we would rather do a speculum if there was any doubt. When should we now, and now I'm talking about um, um, facilities where as it as sort of should be, where low risk women are managed by, by midwives. We might be finding ourselves at an MOU or a CHC where there's no cesarean section facility. So now we are talking about when should we call a senior? When should we call a doctor? When should we transfer that woman? In the latent phase, so obviously if maternal and or fetal condition are non-reassuring, there's something we worry about. When should the woman be transferred up or when must advice be called more is when the mother is draining MSL. And we are talking all MSL. We're not talking thin or thick or grade one to two to three. It's a very subjective decision sometimes. We all know the light yellow one and the thick pea soup one, but we all know there's like a hundred variations in between. All MSL in the latent phase should either be assessed by a senior if you are in the hospital or transfer to a hospital where there's a cesarean section facility. Then what else? And now we're keeping in mind MOU, CHCs that might not be able to keep a woman for longer than 12 hours, ruptured membranes for more than 12 hours if she's still in the latent phase, or we are still not at five centimeters after 12 hours. Like I said, we give women 24 hours, but the majority of women is in the active phase long before that. So we just want to um, make sure that after, after 12 hours, that woman gets reassessed and we have a look at what's, what's going on. Then in the active phase, same story, maternal or non-reassuring maternal or fetal condition. MSL here, yes, we transfer or we call for a second opinion or for a senior assessment if the delivery is not imminent. The last thing we want to do is have a woman 
who's G2P1, who's nine centimeters dilated, and now there's MSL, so we, we put her in the ambulance. The, the, the safest place for a woman to deliver is in the facility, not in the ambulance. So that's why it says delivery not imminent. If she would have poor contractions and she's not progressing, or if she, um, her progress exceeds the action line. Coming to the partogram, and I'm not gonna go into detail here, uh, what is the partogram? It's a graphical record of progress of labor, allows for the monitoring of mother and baby. It should be used in, um, in every labor, so for every labor at all the facilities that are doing deliveries. And we all know that a partogram is often uh, completed retrospectively, especially with women that come in advanced active phases, but it has to be used. If we use a partogram properly, we actually shouldn't be writing a note with every assessment. We did everything we need to know fits on a partogram and we need to start using it once the woman is in labor. Not going into detail here, we obviously need to complete the details and extending the timeline, but the most important thing is obviously uh, where the latent phase one block now accounts for two hours. Reporting the fetal condition, fetal condition includes baseline heart rate, the presence of decelerations, yes or no, the type of decelerations if they would be there, and the, the state of the membranes and the color of the lipo. Progress of labor, again, it's so much more than just cervical dilatation, it includes application, what is the presenting part, and then our kaput or molding. So zero kaput, meaning there's no swelling of that fetal head, one plus our kaput might be one centimeter thick, two plus two centimeters thick, there could be a three plus there, which usually indicates um, generalized um, kaput, so a bit of generalized edema there, which might be in, an indication of CPD, or cephalopelvic dispropor disproportion. Then molding, zero, one plus, two plus, three plus. What is molding? This is all textbook. Again, nothing changes. This is standard. Molding is obviously the molding of the fetal skull bones to allow for labor and passage to the birth canal. Why is this molding? And we are talking about the sagittal suture and the parietal skull bones. This is the molding that's, that's important. There may be some anteroposterior molding, but that is not the one we are worried about when we talk about CPD. We are worried about this sagittal molding, this left to right, ear to ear. Why are we so worried about that? Because this is the smallest diameter of that fetal head. This is a fetus trying to make its smallest diameter even smaller to pass through. That is CPD, when those sutures are overlapping and you can't reduce them anymore. We need to note the progress um, of labor furthermore by the position of the head, the cervical dilatation with an X, length with a, with a, a vertical line, and the head above pelvis, pelvis and fifths above the brim. The plotting dilatation, nothing changes. We start on the um, utmost left block in the uh, um, latent phase. When we transfer into the active phase, we go to the alert line. We don't start at the left block, we go to the alert line. And we have an example here, uh, latent phase to the left. We see she starts at two with the head five fifths above the brim. She goes to four centimeters six hours later. We have PV'd her after two hours, most likely because her contractions change. She's six, we transfer her to the alert line now. Recording of the contractions, again, nothing changes, and I apologize, I see my figures don't, don't um, project properly. We know we're supposed to color in the number of blocks um, equivalent to the number of contractions in 10 minutes, and we are supposed to um, um, fill in that block as per duration of those contractions using dots for less than 20 seconds, vertical stripes for 20 to 40, and a completely colored block for more than 40 seconds. These are our contractions, so short and only two, then three a bit longer, and then we're actually talking good contractions. When we talk about good contractions, we talk three to five per 10 minutes, not less, not more. We should be completing maternal observations and documenting management, pain relief, and obviously signing off. And it always says so nicely signature and rank, but we all know that signatures are scribbles and that never tells us who actually monitored that, that, that woman. So it would actually better to, to sign off with initials or with a surname and a rank just to know who actually observed the patient. Now, slow progress in labor. And I keep repeating myself, we are not reinventing the wheel here. Whether you use the older partogram or we use the, the, the one that, that was issued two years ago, I keep wanting to say new, it's actually not that new anymore. If the woman now progresses slowly, we assess the four Ps. 
that is still very much the same thing. Assess the patient. Is she in too much pain? Is she dehydrated, meaning is she tachycardic? Is she um, having ketones, very concentrated, low volume urines? Is the bladder full? Assess the powers, so the inadequate contractions. If there's adequate progress and you think the contractions are, are a bit weak, as long as she, she has progressed adequately, we leave that be. Powers come into play when our progress is, is, is no longer adequate and the patient is progressing slowly. Looking at the passenger, are we dealing with an abnormal presentational position? Maybe this is an OP or something like that. Then the actual passage, the pelvis being too small for the baby, our, our, our CPD, which is usually indicated um, by fetal distress, kaput and molding. Always assess these four Ps. And again, this is my main message. Assess the baby, assess the mother. If there is slow progress and both mom and baby are fine, we can give that woman a little bit more time if she is slowly progressing. She may be that woman who just needs more time. And us intervening here with drips, with AROMs, with oxytocin, then subsequently a Caesar, then after that a hysterectomy because now she's septic. That is what we are trying to, to avoid. So the slow progress may sometimes be due to inadequate contraction. So when the powers are truly insufficient, especially in a prima gravida, we may want to restore the normal progress then by rupturing membranes and giving oxytocin, reassessing two hours later. And then if we have achieved our good contractions, um, but there's still no progress, we may want to deliver by season. Keep in mind that slow progress may be due to any of the four Ps and be worried about secondary labor arrest, meaning a woman has initially progressed, a multi parous woman, and now she gets stuck. The progress stops at six, seven centimeters. It may be the first sign of CPD, even if she's had three NPDs before. Augmentation with oxytocin in these scenarios is extremely dangerous and may be the cause of rupture. Second stage, nothing changing. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to be a little bit faster. Um, full dilatation to uh, desire to bear down is usually only in retrospect, which we often call the passive phase or the first phase of the second stage. Uh, and then the actual active phase of the second stage or the second phase where there's a desire to bear down and the delivery. Guidelines for second stage um, or the second phase of the second stage have not changed. If a woman is pushing, she should never be pushing by herself. Someone, preferably a midwife, must constantly be with a patient. The heart rate should be checked after every second contraction and the descent and progress every 15 minutes. Um, the durations, 45 minutes for, active, for a, a, a prime up, 30 minutes for a multip, nothing has changed. Obviously, like I said, you check the descent every 15 minutes. That it's always been the recommendation, meaning if a prime up has good contractions, she's got adequate pushing efforts. But after 15 and then after 30 minutes, there is no descent at all. Labor should, um, help should obviously be, be called. There's no point in letting someone push adequately for 45 minutes and nothing has happened. Um, if there's slow progress or an arrest in the second stage, if the, the head is palpable above the brim, we prefer to do a cesarean section. You can consider up to one fifth uh, above the brim um, to do an assisted delivery, but, but we obviously need the skill. Good. I now have, yes, just three, um, sorry, partograms that I um, wanted to show you of women who are managed according to the, um, um, updated partogram and the updated guidelines. So what you see is a prima gravida who is low risk, who is at term, who was admitted in spontaneous labor being two centimeters dilated. She progressed to six, we plotted her on the alert line and four, cent uh, four, four centimeters, sorry, four hours later, she is eight. She is now on our review line. Meaning we are having a woman with some slow progress, right? But we see our fetal monitoring is fine, maternal monitoring is fine, our powers are adequate, nothing is completed here in terms of kaput and molding. So basically our four Ps are fine. These are the women we want to keep our hands off. There is progress of labor. This is again the review line. This is not action line and action does not equal do a Caesar. These are women who are in a perfectly well condition. Mom is fine, baby's fine, the contractions are fine. This is that woman who just needs a little bit more time. The second one 
It's also a prima gravera who was six centimeters there, who then four hours later repeats um, six centimeters. So there's no progress at all. Again, assess the, the, the four Ps. Baby fine, clear like well, no kaput, no molding. Mother's vitals are not recorded, but I will just tell you that they are fine. But what we see is that here we have inadequate contractions. So these are the cases where you would want to augment your labor. If she had progressed, if she would have been on eight, yes, she has um, some slow or at nine, she would have some slower progress. You could consider waiting. If you wait here, the baby will probably remain fine. The mother will probably remain fine, but your cervix will most likely also remain at six centimeters. So this is where you will um, intervene to augment. Then the last case I wanted to demonstrate is this typical multi paris woman who is gravida for para three at term, who progresses with strong contractions to six. Um, here we have a, a, a baby who seems to be doing sort of okay. We have a fetal heart rate of 156, but we already have two plus kaput, two, two plus molding. She here repeats, because now we have some fetal distress, we have meconium stained lyco, we assess there's now three plus molding. These are the women where we must be extremely cautious with, with, with augmenting labor. And we think it is very obvious because obviously this partogram is obvious, but it is sometimes not always that clear. And you have to be careful if labor arrests in a multi, multi paris woman that we are not going to augment this woman and causing a uterine rupture and a dead baby. That's, I think, the end of, of my lecture. Not I think, I know this is the end of my um, lecture. I would like to thank you for, for joining and attending. Um, and I hope I've made everything a little bit more clear for, for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Valerie. Yeah, it's, um, it's a very interesting talk, you know, because it's something new. It's, uh, there's a lot of questions, as you can see on the Q&A. But I think you've really summarized it um, quite well and um, clarified some of the uncertainties that we may have had, um, most of us. Um, I think the bottom line probably um, to, 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 to emphasize or maybe the emphasis should be that these are guidelines which are out there recommended. And I think they emphasize that, you know, labor is not necessarily just cervical dilatation as you, you've alluded to um, a couple of times. So you have to check everything else um, um, I, we seem to be more worried about the duration of the labor and therefore wanting to intervene. But uh, I think the interesting thing is uh, how, how, how far are we with, with implementation? As one could imagine, managing change, you know, with the work of uh, Prof. Friedman having been in place for so many decades. I actually came across um, um, his commentary on one of the journals where his uh, um, um, question whether or not these new guidelines from the WHO are justified. So I'm just wondering, you know, as a country, South Africa, and um, as a low middle income country, how, how far are we with the implementation of these, um, of these guidelines? Because it's a very contentious issue. Yeah, it is. It's, so there's, um, how must I put it? There's areas in the country that have easily adopted um, these updated guidelines, meaning I think, um, uh, many of us who especially work with maternity case records have seen that um, the partogram has updated. So there's areas in the country where um, it is used without any issues. It is not increasing complications and so on. But there's um, uh, some reluctance in other areas of the country. And I will try to be very correct. I'm not going to name any areas. But I'm so happy I'm giving this talk today because there seems to be movement. So in this whole guideline development group, as well as the partogram updating group, the NDOH was very much involved. And they are actually currently almost in the process of signing everything off, which means once it's signed off by the people high up, it means it will become standard practice and, and, and not really a choice of what we want to use. And I think the fear of using it comes mostly from the fact that, you know, it's, it's, it's a maternity case record that has sort of been issued without any explanation and it looks so different and we are worried. And uh, um, so we are close to standard implementation. And I was just browsing through the questions a little bit. I 
see that there's that there's people asking, do we have the capacity for that? The answer is actually yes, we do have the capacity for that. We did account for those MOU CHDs that are have uh, short staffed and have um, a, a low number of beds. So that is why we we allow for this. You can refer to a higher level facility, but again, do not be scared. Most women are not going to reach that 24 hours. We are talking about a prima gravida who comes with contractions, who stip of finger with a long firm cervix. Those women need more time. So you can pre, um, refer that woman if you don't have the capacity. Secondly, we are hoping to reduce the cesarean section rate. So if we can reduce the caesar rate, we would actually see that, yes, we might have some laboring women in the hospital and some of them may labor a little bit longer but they will be discharged the day after delivery, whereas a cesarean section patient stays in the hospital for two to three hours. So we might be able to redistribute our beds a little bit where um, we might have less cesarean sections and we might need some more laboring beds. And then the last thing I wanted to add on this, this worry about, about um, um, the beds and the duration, we actually, I mentioned the WHO is developing a labor care guide where um, we shouldn't be intervening. There's no more alert lines at all. And I think my friend and, and, and high esteemed colleague from, from a district hospital, so Pretoria West Hospital close um, to Kalafong actually piloted that new labor care guide. And we did not see um, a, a difference in, in duration of labor, not now taking much longer. So what we did there is we, we wanted to see the feasibility, not the outcomes of the mother, but truly the feasibility. Is it user-friendly? We showed that it was, but it also didn't increase the duration of labor. So um, that's basically what um, the answer to that would be. So we shouldn't be too worried. We are just extending the cutoffs so we would intervene a bit less, but the majority of patients will long deliver before, uh, before that. Thanks. Um, thanks, thanks, Valerie. Thanks for that um, response. There's a few other questions, basically, which are um, asking about how to plot, um, um, whether or not we should be plotting when the patient is coming in in advanced labor, and also how to plot if the patient is now being augmented. I think uh, um, um, a question yeah. there by um, anonymous, a few questions that uh, that yeah, but uh, basically it's a question where they actually ask if um, how 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 would you plot and say now you've diagnosed poor progress all the P's are fine except for the powers and you now put on uh, uh, the patient on oxytocin. How do you yep. then proceed to plot? Good, so if you have a patient on augmentation, um, what we continue to plot is again, so once a patient is on augmentation, she qualifies for CTG, no longer for intermittent um, monitoring. So the fetal heart rate should continue to be plotted every 30 minutes, but should be assessed almost continuously because we know that oxytocin is augmentation, we're increasing the number of contractions and the baby may not tolerate it. Secondly, the contractions in the active phase allows for an every 30 minute block to be completed. So there you can actually um, color the contractions, so um, the, the, the blocks for the contractions, because what you aim with um, oxytocin is to increase the duration and the, the frequency of contractions. Again, your PV or vagina examination should be done after two hours. So your plotting will continue and you, allow, you have your space to actually document your, your oxytocin use under the, the, um, the, the pathograph, the one that actually allows for the cervicograph as it's formally called, where you plot the cervix, you can write your, your dose of oxytocin. So uh, that's, the, that's the one answer, I hope. And then for advanced labor, what we tend to do is we are always writing full notes on the white pages in a partogram, which will take you more time than actually just completing the partogram. Now, I do want to mention that if you have a patient who comes in fully dilated, head on perineum, right? I think in those scenarios, we shouldn't be wasting our time completing a partogram. We should be doing fetal monitoring and delivering the patient, if you, you understand my point, I think. But use the partogram because just one look at it, right? You don't even always have to see the actual numbers. You, the way the blood pressure and the heart rate of the mother is plotted, the way the cervical dilatation and the descent are plotted, just by looking at it, you can see what's happening. You can see an, a maternal heart rate going up or down. You can see a cervix that is not dilating or a descent. You can assess a descent just by looking at it, whether it goes from five to three fifths or from four to two, you can see change visually. So I can only advocate to truly using the partogram. Okay, 
Thank you, Valer. And another one now, perhaps as you were talking about CTGs, um, there's a question from Anonymous and also Dr. Kregel, I'll just try to group them. Um, where, where Dr. Kregel is asking, why, why would one want to put a CTG on uh, someone who's undergoing trial of labor after Caesar or VBEC? Okay. And the yeah. other question from Anonymous is about legal liability. Say so now this case goes to the courts and I've been doing inter, um, intermittent fecal, uh, fetal um, auscultation without CTG tracing on paper. Um, am I protected as a practitioner if you know things don't go well with the with the baby? Yeah, good. So um, the one question so about the CTGs. So firstly, um, I think the one was doing the am I correct, Billy? The, the admission CTG for a VBAC, right? For a VBAC, so, yeah. yes. So a patient who comes with a previous scar on the uterus is per definition a high risk patient because that um, muscle of the uterine wall has been interrupted by a scar from a previous cesarean section. It's a weak spot. It is at risk of, of, of um, rupturing during labor. So what we want to do is we actually want to see when that woman comes in, one of the conditions or the prerequisites she needs to meet before we can continue her trial of labor is that the fetal condition is fine. And the way to assess that is a CTG. So we do want to do a baseline CTG. We are a little bit worried to just do intermittent auscultation there, because again, if we do the CTG, what the difference with the auscultation will be that um, we will pick up the variable D cells and the early D cells. But if we get D cells, even in early labor in a feedback, we are a bit worried about potential scar dehiscences and subsequently a uterine rupture. So we do advocate for an um, admission CTG in um, a patient coming from feedback. And many of us also have the habit of doing admission CTGs for low risk women and then continuing with um, um, intermittent auscultation, but there's no evidence to actually support that. And this takes us back to the other question of how are you um, legally um, uh, protected? So I'm obviously not, I'm not a lawyer and I, as I know a little bit how lawyers work and they'll try to find something and some small paper somewhere that says you should have done a CTG. What I know and from the evidence that I know and, and um, what, what we have been putting together what, what it, when it comes to fetal monitoring is that CTGs, they're the only thing sort of that we have to monitor in labor, right? But they are not very sensitive, uh, very sensitive, yeah. Meaning you can do a CTG. When we do CTGs, we mostly do them for our own peace of mind because we want to see it perfectly normal, right? So a CTG is a specific tool, meaning if it's normal, you sort of excluded that the baby is asphyxiated, but it's not sensitive. If that CTG is abnormal, it doesn't mean that this, that this child is not, go, um, not going to have an HIE or an asphyxia. So if you've done your intermittent auscultation and you have documented at the appropriate intervals where the latent or active phase, that this heart rate was normal, and there's no MSL or another risk factor that warrants doing a CTG, then you should be protected. It's also unlikely that you would then have a poor outcome if you were truly monitoring the baby as, as, as it should be. It's always possible with a severe event like an abrupt show or things like that, but that has nothing to do with your intermittent auscultation. So what we know from CTGs is they are not a good performer, but they are the best thing we have and, and we like to use them. But they, especially in low risk patients, do not reduce the rates of HIEs and asphyxias. They only increase the seizure rate without benefits for the baby. So we try to steer away from that because we are actually increasing the seizures. Because when we see a few decelerations, we we all feel more comfortable just quickly taking the patient to theater and getting the baby out. I hope that answers the, the, the question. Yeah, indeed. I think it's it's very interesting what um, and the lawyers actually would be chasing the CTG, mm -hmm. and we all know by now that um, cerebral palsy or NNE actually can be caused by various factors from antenatal to labor to exactly. the delivery. So the CTG is not really a tool. Um, 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 that we should use to base, you know, um, um, bad outcomes on. Um, now, when it comes to, there's a, there's a question from Lona, um, where she, he or she is asking about um, high-risk patients such as those that are undergoing VBEX, whether or not we monitor them the same way as all the other low-risk patients, like okay. give them more time um, to labor. Yeah, so that is, a VBEX is always 
Um, I think for VBACs, as for other high-risk patients, you can't make rules. Um, even for low-risk women, we should be sort of doing an individualized management, but especially when it comes to high-risk women, it is supposed to be a, a, um, a, a individual, individualized management. So with VBACs, the general sort of recommendations, I was tempted to say rules, but again, I must get away from saying rules. We don't have rules, we have recommendations. So if you want um, to do a VBAC, one of the general recommendations is that this, the woman's um, progress of labor should be adequate, meaning up until now, it has always been to the left of the alert line. Now, obviously, these new recommendations have not been um, um, tested in such a degree that we can we use this longer um, labor progress for a VBAC as well. I think up until now, the same, and this is my opinion, the, the recommendations for a VBAC still apply when, um, um, as, as they did before, so I'm also reading other questions before. So um, the, the same recommendations for a VBAC still apply that you want the labor to progress to the left of the alert line. If it doesn't progress, we are a little bit stuck. Giving oxytocin, especially in our public hospital setting, is a very, very risky thing to do. I will be very honest, where I come from in Belgium, we do induce. Uh, women with previous seasons, we do augment them, but you really need nearly one-on-one -on -one care, continuous monitoring, immediate access to theater in case something goes wrong. So I think um, good patient selection for VBAC, appropriate counseling of the woman, and trust me, I'm, I'm all for VBAC. I feel like we do way too, too, too few, we do way too, too little VBACs, but it comes to a good patient selection preferably spontaneous labor and a good progress of labor. So yes, you do use the same pathogram, but when you are dealing with slow labor or, or no progress of labor, there's not that much we can do. We can't really now um, rupture this patient's membrane and give oxytocin. But again, it is also a shared decision-making progress with the patient, mm -hmm. because if she declines the cesarean section at all costs, then we will have to do something. So then we can discuss with her to potentially augment labor on the condition that she understands the potential risks or the time it would take to go to theater in the end. Mm -hmm. Dr. Valerie, thanks, thanks for that. There's a, there's a number of questions which talk to the health system's um, readiness to implement um, the guidelines. Um, I, I mean, maybe the, the, the response I'm kind of like trying to get from you is, I see someone says free state, they, they are fully implementing. Have you seen any change in terms of uh, maternal fetal outcomes, you know, in those um, specific yeah. regions? Also in terms of human resources, you know, um, do these guidelines require specific um, ratios, uh, patient, I mean, uh, midwife per number of patients to change? I don't know what the experience is so far. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, it's, it's, I think, a very difficult question to answer because um, when these, these guidelines were implemented and the pathogram was implemented, this was right before that, that big pandemic hit us, where mm -hmm. all the focus shifted from any other guideline and any other um, practice to COVID monitoring and outcomes and things like that. What we know generally in the country over the past two, three years, the seizure rate has increased even further, but that has nothing to do, according to me, with this pathogram, that has all to do with COVID because we know that, that COVID has increased the cesarean section rate for iatrogenic reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing, the actual outcomes we, we don't know. We and I work in an area where there's quite a bit of reluctance to actually implement the pathogram. It's even though the big development group was, was, was here in Gauteng and now I'm naming and shaming almost, don't, don't please forgive me, but we okay. work in an area where there's a big reluctance to sign off and implement, whereas the other areas in the country, like mm. the Free State, like the Western Cape, have actually implemented without any um, issues, without any human resource issues. Because like I said, you may have a bit longer labor, but keep in mind, and this is a very straightforward example. Doing a, P, a vaginal examination, a PV in a laboring woman takes time. You need to get her on the bed. You need to get her on the back. You need to get your, your gloves and so on. Taking away from doing all these frequent vaginal examinations opens up time to actually monitor women properly. And then the second thing I want to advocate for is having a good companion in labor. 
it is extremely important because that companion can take away some duties in pain support where a woman is crying and panicking and she usually shouts for help, we can have that companion. And there again, I feel like we must sort of stop hiding behind COVID and using that as an excuse about why companions are not allowed. Many facilities have stopped screening on admission, only do it when it's indicated medically or for high care or ICU admissions. So we should be, if we have good hygiene and perhaps still screening, we should be allowing companions into our labor wards. And it will, in my opinion, not increase the, the human resources issues um, drastically. What does increase the strain on the health system is all the admin that comes with, with working in a labor ward, is the registers and the forms, and COVID did not help that at all. So I think that is also why many healthcare workers feel extremely strained working in, in laboring, uh, labor ward um, facilities. Great, great, great. I think that is, uh, you, you, you have really responded very positively um, to, to that question, um, Doc. Now, with respect to the old pathogram, so I'm not working in labor ward, but I'm involved in a lot of quality assurance assessments, <clears throat> issues around patient safety incidences, and uh, we know the, the recording and completion of the record Hey, most of the time it's not, you know, um, fully, you know, recorded or or, or complied with. Um, you know, I don't know what's the experience in in these regions. Um, have the completion rates improved? But maybe also, how do we then incentivize health workers? You know, because um, I presume at some point we're gonna have these registers now. You know, as a a standard in the country where they are being used, but they are only good if they are completed by, exactly. by the professionals, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. So what we know about a part of that is that yeah. whether you use the old or the new one, you reduce the cesarean section rate if you properly monitor labor. I'm not saying monitor the cervix, I'm saying monitor labor, right? Labor. So mm. we have a, t um, um, a, 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 a tendency to, to intervene quite quickly and it's only half completed. But what you do find if you look at a maternity case record is that the, mm. the, the um, partogram is only half completed, but there's three pages of notes behind it. So mm. I think we do need to focus on, and completing the partogram is an admin act, but completing the partogram comes from properly monitoring the mother, properly monitoring the baby and properly monitoring labor. So that if we can do that properly, it will in turn lead to completing the partogram properly and hopefully eventually lead to um, cesareans, uh, re re reducing our cesarean section rate. And then in the end, because that's actually what we aim for, having healthy babies and no longer mothers that die from bleeding because now they had a seizure. So mm -hmm. I think focusing on completing it, I personally don't have experience. Like I said, I work in an, in an environment where there is reluctance and where we are still stuck on the old one. But again, we always see partograms that are half completed, then quickly completed in retrospect. And now we've done a Caesar at five centimeters for poor progress. And that sort of disappoints me so much because mm -hmm. mom and baby were fine until they went to theater. You know what I mean? So that's a bit... Yeah, and then the last thing I wanted to add on about the staffing issue is that if we do seizures for poor progress and augmenting, once you augment someone, she needs more intensive monitoring. So if we talk about the human, I'm sorry, I'm going back to human resource issues and yes, staffing issues and burdening yeah. the midwives. <laughs> but if we yeah. are augmenting labor very uh, vigorously and we are doing seizures, then we also, um, that also means we are putting one midwife much closer to the one woman who needs to be augmented. And if this um, uh, patient goes to theater, we are taking that midwife out of labor ward completely to go and stand in theater with the patient to, to take the baby when it's born and so on. So there's a lot of um, things we can discuss when it comes to human resource issues. And I know there's, there's the, the, I can't call it the camp, it means we're almost enemies, but there is the, 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 the opinion that it will strain resources, but then there's the opinion from me and a lot of other colleagues who were also part of this group is that not necessarily, we must just allocate our resources appropriately and focusing on the right things to do. 
Yes, uh, I want to, I saw that uh, we have uh, Prof. Sam Munukwani. I'm just going to put him on the spot. I'm not sure if he's ready to make any comment. That means I'm, that means but, I'm going to be put on the spot also. <laughs> But please do take a sip of water because I think you've been talking for like an hour. Yeah, uh, Prof, uh, I'm not sure if you are able to hear us. It would be great to hear your voice. Just any comments, commentary that you might want to make. You may unmute your mic if it's feasible. It would be great to hear your voice. Thanks. Oh, thank you, uh, Billy. No, uh, I was trained by Philpot, so I just want to make a few comments. Okay. Uh, the new pathogram is a misnomer to say it's new. Uh, at the Sasso Congress in March 2020, Prof. E.T. Mokoko, I wish he was part of the listening because they are the pioneers of that uh, uh, pathogram under the great Professor Kaiten, who came up with two fifths, etc. And uh, looking at the pelvis of a black woman, which was up to today of smaller dimension compared to other uh, uh, racial groups. But coming to the pathogram, Philpot, when he drew the pathogram in the then Rhodesia, he was saying, and this was meant for midwives in rural uh, Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, to say, midwives, you are monitoring labor in those clinics, I'm giving you this period so that you are able to transfer timelessly. The athlete line can never be done away with because it was to make midwives. The aim of the patrogram was essentially for midwives to be able to monitor labor. And Philport commented, they were seeing lots of tragedies. And you've been asking this patrogram re-outcome what is it? We still have to see, because remember, currently, I, I was just typing here. I had to go and defend Department of Health for 30 cases of cerebral palsy in the Johannesburg High, uh, High Court some years back. Professor Buchmann was still around. And in many of them, prolonged labor, CTGs not done. The judge was just ripping us apart. Is there a role of a CTG? I think uh, we've got about three or four cases that I went for George Mukari in Harangua, where by having an entry CTG and some of form of monitoring intrapartum, especially that you are presented with, or rather the court wants you to present evidence. Midwives are overwhelmed. So sometimes you've got one midwife, like in our labor or to manage six patients, surely a CTG has a role. You may not put everybody agree, but at least evidence that you have managed this patient is, or, or, or you've looked after this fetal heart is to be documented. And I'm saying role of CTG. And I argued with Professor McDonald. He came to us and said, no, you guys, you're doing two, many CTGs, I can tell you, in a court of law, they've protected us because we had shown this baby came in this poor condition or this condition, and then we acted upon. So that's point number one. Two is that the pathogram, when we were writing the maternity guidelines, we, we used to have three centimeters, Buchmann, Pattinson, Jack Moodley, this was under the chairmanship of Jack Moodley. Uh, some of us attended, I remember taking Dr. Mashamba with me, I'm Alan Cameron, and we said, let's agree on the four centimeters because three centimeters fully effaced. That's when Philport says it should be the active phase. May, very few people are tactically. You see, labor, management of labor is skill. It's like uh, football. You have players, but there'll be a Ronaldo who and so forth. So what am I saying is to say, it's an art. We said four centimeters for the benefit of standardizing and to say active phase in our region will say it starts at four centimeters and above so that you eliminate that problem of fully effaced three centimeters dilated. So that's the second point. The third point, 
I think from four to five, I don't have any qualms with it. But where I want to warn is to say, and Belfort has shown it in the Sashua Congress in 2019 here in Johannesburg, where they had uh, used the same pathogram as it's now mooted, showed clearly that outcome may not be necessarily protected. So what, do we, what am I saying? Yes, let's adopt it, but be very vigilant. Because I can tell you, for everybody to relax, no labor, women are different. Two, you are dealing with a small pelvis compared to what the Europeans are saying. So from my side, it's just to throw caution that let's not throw everything away. We adopt it, we say five centimeters in the active phase. Uh, we've had cases in the court of law of prolonged latent phase. Now I agree with Valerie that that definition becomes very difficult. Philport, when he adopted the eight versus the 12, he noted that the Shona woman in Zimbabwe has got the same pelvis as a Zulu woman in Natal. And if you go on and on and on, remember that contractions are also hammering that baby. The oxygenation of that baby is very important. So from my side is to say, as it's piloted, we will have to see, you can never neglect the outcomes. And outcomes currently, Prof. Mawela in uh, a neonatal unit at George Mukari, every time I go there, even now as I've retired, I do Tuesdays, I walk in there, they say, Prof, we've got lots of HIEs. What is happening in that labor ward? I go silently, study the pathogram. I can tell you that labor has to have limits. Two, if we adopt that we're going to take so many hours as we are told, we need to be very vigilant in our monitoring. So from my side, thank you. It was a nice presentation, but uh, one has to put it into perspective. When Phil Port put the alert line, it was an alert for the midwife to say, is it the time to transfer or not? So that was very important. So that the midwife doesn't hang around with the patient for too long and find the head jammed in the pelvis. And then we have a difficult cesarean section and poor outcomes. Colleagues, we still see these tragedies. So mm -hmm. let's conclude by saying, adopt the pathogram, two, be vigilant, Three, don't throw away everything. That's my caution. Thank you. Okay, Prof. I think that is clear. Maybe let me, before I go back to you, Dr. Valerie, to say your closing remarks. Dr. Magagula, uh, how do you, how do we balance? Uh, I think, because what I get here is, it's at which point do you decide to intervene or not? So yeah. how, how, how does one balance, you know, over treatment versus uh, delayed or even under treatment? Uh, Dr. Billy, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here, Ellis. I just got I want uh, to hear from you because you are, you are a practicing clinician. So from a clinician's point of view, how, how, because yeah. I think that is where the, because I I, when I hear Prof's comments, he's agreeing with everything, but he's saying, we need to be clear as well in terms of when do you, you know, you, you re the, I think the issue of review versus uh, action, you know, how, how do we balance yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's good to have the discussion. And remember, you know, we, we, we work with evidence-based medicine and if we don't follow evidence, then we run the risk of practicing medicine that is not really um, evidence-based. And I've seen a few comments where, colleagues are saying we are on defensive medicine. The danger with defensive medicine is that we end up not practicing evidence-based medicine. Um, and I think uh, if you are practicing evidence-based medicine, you are probably stand a better chance of arguing in the court of law um, 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 more than if you don't, if you are more defensive in your approach. And I think the emphasis of these new guidelines and the evidence which is uh, actually coming through is the fact that 
it's not an isolated matter of cervical dilatation as such. It's a holistic assessment of this woman who is laboring and understanding that she's different from the next woman who's actually in the same cubicle as her and allowing her to labor naturally. And, and remember, of course, we, we, I think uh, uh, as Valerie has said that these women are not supposed to be neglected. They are supposed to be monitored. And with all things in place, with us practicing evidence-based medicine, we will know when to rupture membranes. We will know when to start oxytocin because we are monitoring the labor as the labor progresses. We monitor the mother, we monitor the baby, we plot on the pathogram as the um, um, guidelines. Um, I don't think as such the guidelines are actually um, a, 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 a tool or um, 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 some recommendation to stray away from practicing good medicine. I think it's actually evidence-based medicine, which probably we should embrace cautiously so as Prof says, um, with everything in balance. Of course, our South African health system is challenged by various things. I mean, lack of staff, lack of monitoring, um, and with a lot of medical legal issues going on, but I think the only defense that we have as healthcare practitioners against all these medical legal issues is to practice um, um, evidence-based medicine. And this is evidence that is being presented. You know, these are Ugandan studies. These are African studies and trials, which are, are, are actually informing the recommendations by WHO. So I think we will know how to and when to intervene if, if, we, if we practice evidence-based medicine and of course, try and make it possible for our health system, which is of course ailing. Yeah, thank you, Alice. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Magadula. Yeah. Can I uh, warn, evidence medicine is a myth, doctor. When you are in court, you are faced with a reality. At this stage, you were supposed to intervene. Doctor, why did you? Evidence medicine, based medicine, it's a guide, it's a guide, it's not, cast in stone, it's not the 10 commandments, but what do you need? That's why I've put the emphasis of art. You see, you allow a big baby. Just on Saturday, I was giving a talk in uh, some northern part of Hamaskral in a rural or rather plot area. And uh, a lady, uh, a gentleman came after and says, Prof, my daughter went at uh, Louis Pasteur to deliver labor was said to be normal until it complicated when for Caesar, that woman died. Now, when she, he told me all the facts, as I listened, they called a relative or somebody who managed to see the fire. And it was a question of prolonged labor with us saying it's going all correct, correct. What am I saying? I'm saying at some stage, the guidelines in terms of the timing of, of uh, Inter intervention are very important too. As the Valerie has put it, that we leave it like that, the two hourly blocks of latent phase, as long as all is going well. You must underline that for that family, for that woman. And now with all these babies that are HIEs, meconium stain like her, we are seeing problems of who are monitoring in labor. So we shouldn't just brush it aside, evidence, evidence. We need to say at the end, Belfort has challenged this in the SASUOC to say, we show the evidence from the USA using the same tool. These were the outcomes. Professor Chauke at the, that Congress, I'm not sure if he's in, he was also cautious to say, hey, this tool of yours may lead us into more problem. Now I'm saying, no, let's adopt the tool, but don't throw away basics that were there developed by Philport. Philport didn't develop in a thumb sack. He developed this based on reality in the rural Zimbabwe. And he had trained in Natal at his ONG before he went to uh, Rhodesia. So he was able to compare that these are the same apples. He will need to guide, guard and guide the midwife out there. The other thing that Valerie, you haven't talked about is when to do AROM, just simple AROM. Philport used to say when the cervix is three centimeters dilated, fully effaced. Now, as I said, the Jack Moodley partisan, we had met Buchmann, we said four centimeters is when the active phase starts. And by definition, if a woman is in labor, you must rupture membrane between four and six centimeters. Because if you leave it long and long, 
We are seeing lots of babies that are meconium stain lycra uh, that could have been detected much earlier. So you can't leave labor on and on and say rupture will rub, membranes will rupture spontaneous. We equally have cases of rupturing spontaneously, cord prolapses and deaths. So I'm just cautioning that let's put art in the science to say this is what is happening. Thank you, colleagues. But okay. Valerie, com compliments for a good presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. That's it for tonight. Uh, Dr. Valerie, um, yes, uh, your closing um, um, remarks. I think after everything that has been said, um, you know, we, yeah, let me hear from you. And then I'll also uh, say key things that I've captured uh, from your presentation. Thanks. Okay, Thank you so much. Thanks, Lise Huandeli. Thank you, Prof. Monokwan. It's very interesting to hear your side of things. I first want to start by saying I think your comments are absolutely valid. And I, I, I'm, I'm taking your comments to stress that to everyone who's listening, whether it's three or four or five centimeters, focus on monitoring the mother and the fetus. That is where the, the crucial point is. That's the one thing. And then secondly, those names you mentioned, um, Prof. Eckhart Buchmann, Prof. Bob Pattinson, they were part of this whole development. So um, it, it's nice to actually have had people on board who were part of the previous updates and so on. And I'm, I'm using Prof. Pattinson's word when he said is when we were so aggressive with labor, we thought we were doing well. The problem is that we are, and I think Billy sort of touched on that, is that we were overdoing things when we are now over... Um, doing seizures sometimes. And when we look at, at the PIP analysis of those HIE babies, babies who are asphyxiated and die, yes, many of them have poor, prog poor progress, but the pathogram wasn't used properly. The monitoring wasn't done properly. So um, I think it would actually be nice to meet at one point and just have an ongoing discussion because I can, <laughs> I can go on for a very long time. <laughs> but I really, I really thank yeah. you for your points. And I thank you, Lesejo and Billy. And I really hope that I can, I can convince everyone that don't be scared yeah. of those durations. They are exceptions mm. rather than the rule. Women mm. progress, but monitor the baby and monitor the mother. That is, I think, my main message. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Veller. Colleagues, uh, you know, it's a very informative session. We were supposed to finish at seven and we are still here. So what I want to say uh, from my side, it's just a few things. Remember, care must be person-centered, right? And I think Billy mentioned this, that the woman you are looking at now is not necessarily the same as the woman next door or the one you are going to see in the next few minutes. It's very important that you provide compassionate care, you know, um, which is uh, respectful to both the mother, you know, and, and the child. And, and I think Dr. Valerie kept on repeating this, assess the mother and the child. It's not just about the graph. You know, sometimes the graph is going this way, but check the mother and the child. And if they are stable, usually, you know, you are able to make a better clinical um, decisions. Um, and, and I wrote this, Dr. Valerie, you know, I was listening very carefully, you know, a, a review line is not an action line and action is not a, a cesarean section. And my take home from that is that we need to really minimize the over treatments and, uh, you know, over treating where really, you know, there are no obvious clinical indications for some of the interventions because these particular interventions, especially cesarean sections, have certain negative implications, especially in the context of, of district hospitals where surgical skills are not so top notch. And also when things go wrong, half the time, uh, hospitals are not prepared, you know, and most women end up bleeding or even losing, you know, their uteruses and so on. So we have to understand this discussion around that balance uh, between um, um, these issues. And then uh, there's something you've mentioned, Dr. Valerie, you said the labor arrest in a multiparous woman, you have to be very cautious because if you overtreat, then you give uh, some interventions that are not necessarily necessary at that point, you might do more harm than good. Colleagues, I can't summarize today's presentation except to thank you all for participating. Prof. Munugwan, it was great to hear from you, Dr. Magagula. 
you've reminded us of the importance of uh, being evidence-driven. Dr. Valerie, thank you very much for your time.